I am Zara Amer, and this is The Change, a podcast featuring stories about women, technology, and the Anthropocene. This project is an experiment, one that seeks to draw in an ever-growing climate conscientious public by starting and sustaining a mature, informed, and thoughtful conversation about the reality of climate breakdown while identifying the most impactful and scalable technologies that stand to considerably help the environment. The podcast is hosted by my friend, Antoinette Wilson-Marcus. Antoinette and I have received tremendous support from our partners and distributors, which we are very grateful for, and we are very excited to be bringing these stories to a broad audience. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. Dr. Deborah Roberts is currently head of the Sustainable and Resilient City Initiatives Unit in Etiquini Municipality, Durban, South Africa, and was selected as the city's first Chief Resilience Officer in 2013. Dr. Roberts was a lead author of Chapter 8, Urban Areas, of Working Group 2's contribution to the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She was elected as co-chair of Working Group 2 for the IPCC's sixth assessment cycle in 2015. She was also a lead negotiator for the South African delegation involved in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations until December 2015 and a member of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network thematic group on sustainable cities involved in mobilizing international support for the creation of a city-focused SDG, SDG 11. She is an honorary professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in the School of Life Sciences and has been an advisor to the Global Commission on Adaptation, United Cities and Local Governments and the United Nations Secretary General's 2019 Climate Summit. In 2019, she was included in the list of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. In our final Season 1 interview, I will get Deborah's thoughts on climate tech, climate science stubborn climate optimism, South Africa's Anthropocene future, and what it means to be a boundary person. Deborah, I thought we might start by talking about your work at the Sustainable and Resilient City Initiatives Unit in the Etiquini Municipality in Durban. What are you working on at the moment? Hi, and thanks for that question, Antoinette. Well, the unit itself is a very new one. It's only five or so years old, so a lot of the work that we're doing is quite exploratory. Probably the main thrust of our work currently is understanding what resilience means for an African city like Durban. And we've spent a lot of time talking to local stakeholders about that term because it doesn't really translate very easily um, and trying to understand their perception of, of what a resilient city might mean. And that's really taken us to an understanding that residents in Durban feel that resilience is the ability for society to, to deal with change of, of all forms. And that's really taken us to two initial priority areas where people felt if we acted in these areas, we could increase the ability of uh, Durban to deal with forthcoming changes, be they social, economic, or environmental. And those two areas of work really pivot around the issue of informality. So currently we are looking at informal settlements and improving knowledge management systems enable us to approach the challenges and changes in, in informal settlements in a more holistic and, and integrated way. And also focus on governance because Durban, like many African cities, is um, faced with an unusual challenge of having a, a typical form of local government that one might imagine in a city hall, but also dealing with traditional leadership and about 40% of our municipal area is controlled by traditional leadership. And so these are the, the two areas that, that we're currently working in. In your 2016 Barbara Ward lecture, you stressed the importance of implementation, which you described as regularly getting sidelined in favor of innovation. What did you mean by that? You know, I, I think we're all human and, and institutions, be they governmental or non-governmental, I, I think are, are much the same in many ways. They like things that attract attention. So, you know, projects that generate a ribbon cutting opportunity and, and bragging rights. So, Generally, we find that the preference is for things that are bright and, and shiny and the, the, the hard day-to-day -day work that is necessary 
often get sidelined and it's not seen as 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 significant. And hence, um, you know, the desire to have something that's innovative and new because that attracts attention. Well, very often, you know, the biggest part of the solution is simply about getting basics right. And that's simply hard day-to-day work. And I think that's the concern is as we push for innovation and we push for those ribbon cutting opportunities, we're not putting enough focus and emphasis on simply getting the unsexy day-to-day work done. In your talk, you also said, we are certainly going to have to reimagine forms of government that allow everyone to come to the table across all scales, local through international, across horizontal barriers in order to talk about the past, the present, and indeed the future of our city. Could you paint a picture for us of what you had in mind here? Well, I think the real challenge, and while I predominantly work at an international level in the field of climate change, I think there's a growing awareness across the board, given the challenges we all face as a a global society, that we need to have a whole of society response to to these challenges. And that really means welcoming uh, people to the table who've never been there before. You know, if I think about my local government work and the fact that a lot of our current focus is on informal settlements um, and the challenges that they face. If you look at a traditional form of of local government, we often find a scenario where informal settlers are not part of the governance debates in in a city. We treat informality as something that needs to be formalised rather than acknowledging that it's a representation of very real needs and people responding uh, in a way to those needs. So we're often not welcoming the most vulnerable to the table and they are critical because often our solutions will need to provide safety nets for them. Or indeed, often the most relevant uh, people or organizations are not at the table. You know, I think about my time as a, a climate change negotiator, and it always baffled me, although there's a strong emphasis on implementation in the climate change negotiations, the most relevant form of government to implementation, which is local government, is not formally acknowledged within the UN system and is so not at the table in, in terms of the climate change negotiations. And so I think we've, we've really got to you know, tackle some of the sacred cows about what government does, who government is, and, and what government processes look like to offer a much more egalitarian uh, form of, of access to people who are vulnerable and uh, are relevant to, to getting that hard day-to-day work done. So leading on from that, we've heard you caution against invoking technology as the default response to climate change. What other forms of innovation, such as managerial, institutional, or otherwise, are required to adequately respond to climate change? You know, Antoinette, you know, I think perhaps one of the clearest global messages about what we need to do as a society came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that really spoke to us about that whole society response that I've been talking to you about. And when you think about that um, in terms of what that report pulled out in relation to the climate change challenge, it really indicated that the biggest uh, opportunity for change, the biggest challenge we face is getting the necessary political and social will for, for the change. So in many ways, the most important things to be thinking about now are considerations of power, politics, uh, you know, societal behavior, financial flows, who has, who uh, doesn't. And in that sense, when we think about technology, really technology is simply a tool in service to those social aspirations. But unless you sort out the power of politics and social aspirations, technology, you know, is, remains ineffective. So In effect, technology is the easy bit. And by focusing on that, we're ignoring the real challenge, which really lies in that whole of society response and really sorting out the power of politics and and social aspirations of our society. So as a scientist, we assume the public naturally trusts you. You've earned their trust because you are uniquely well qualified to speak to climate issues. And yet the public doesn't universally trust the science of climate change. They do, however, seemingly trust technology wholeheartedly without really understanding how it works and how it could fight climate change. What is it about technology that inspires that kind of blind trust in people? And can science ever really compete? No, Antoinette, I I think that um, duality or division between technology and science is an artificial one. And I think it is is a false one because if you think about it, 
technology is simply applied scientific knowledge. So technology is, is science in action. And the reason people trust technology, think about your day-to-day -day life, it's really improved the quality of our lives. You know, think about access to advanced health services, advanced sanitation, transport. So people can see how technology has intervened physically in their lives and improved it. And we've also seen the evolution in society of how in the current uh, phase of, of our evolution, much of our social lives are now um, mediated through technology, you know, phones and internet. That's the way people connect and communicate, particularly during the, the pandemic. That's really highlighted that. But the important thing about science, it's not only about those end of pipe outcomes like the, the smartphone everyone has in, in their hand these days, but also really asking those challenging questions about us and the world that we live in. And of course, that's going to create debate. Every challenging question, every provocative question that science is going to ask about our past, about our future, what we're currently doing is going to create debate. But that debate is what advances the world and, and the way we approach being in the world. So I don't think we should be scared of a technology science divide. Um, I think science has a place as an agent provocateur in, in society. And, and I, I welcome that debate because by talking to people, we generate new ideas and it's those ideas that, that take us forward. Well, we know you can't talk about your work with the IPCC in great detail, but could you outline for us how your working group is structured and what your role is in that process so that our listeners can get a better understanding of perhaps the inner structural way in which it works? Yeah, thanks, Antoinette. And if, in fact, you invite me back in March next year, I can then talk about the work of, of the IPCC. Um but essentially what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, is a group of 195 governments. And what they do at the beginning of every assessment cycle, and we're currently in the sixth assessment cycle, is they uh, elect a, a group of scientists to produce the reports that governments believe they need uh, from the scientific community to deal with the most pressing uh, climate-related policy challenges that, that they are currently facing. And, and the way that that work is divided up, because it is a very vast exercise that usually takes five to, to seven years, is it's split between three working groups. So there's a working group one, you can see not very imaginative titles, but that deals with the physical science changes. And if you've been watching the media over the last couple of months, you would see that working group one has, in fact, released their report for the sixth assessment cycle. Um, I'm co-chair of Working Group 2. My fellow co-chair is from Germany, and we oversee the development of the report, which will look at impact adaptation and, and vulnerability. And our colleagues in Working Group 3 uh, will produce the report that looks at mitigation opportunities. So effectively, you have um, each working group headed up by two co-chairs, one from the Global North, one from the Global South, supported by a bureau of vice chairs drawn from around the world. Um, and we work with a group of volunteer uh, authors to produce these vast assessment reports that governments then use to inform their policy negotiations at the international level. Thank you, Deborah. In a 2015 interview with Carbon Brief, in response to a question about whether the IPCC should work with communication specialists, you talked about the importance of understanding the value chain of communication. Could you outline now for our listeners what you meant by that? Well, I think the, the real danger is that when we think about communication around tricky issues like climate change and indeed any of the other major challenges we're, we're facing as, as a society, it's hard to imagine a universal communicator, someone who can communicate everything to, to everyone. And so I think there's much more of a value chain where different people have different roles to play in communicating different aspects, for example, of, of the climate change story. And really, in my mind and, and my experience, the, the simplest value chain is you have a scientist who is deeply involved in um, aspects of, of climate change rela related uh, science. Some of those are remarkably good communicators and, and can communicate well with policymakers and other stakeholders. Others, um, they don't see that as, as their core business. And very often then uh, in the value chain, you need a bridging person, someone who is able to interact with the scientific community, 
to understand the key points that's being made and then can take that information um, and relate it in a way that the policymakers can understand um, and articulate that scientific information in the context of a story or related to priorities that policymakers have. And those policymakers then generally talk to their stakeholders um, about priorities and, and so on. So you can see that there's this value chain all the way from the person doing the research, the person they talk to, who's often a bridging person, who then relates to the policymakers, who then in their turn um, add value to, to that message and, and talk to society at, at large. And I think that's the important part of the value chain is that it recognizes that um, there are not too many people in the world who are going to be universal communicators, um, able to talk to everyone about everything, and using the strengths of the different communities to get the strongest possible message out to the people who need it. So the converse part of that equation in communication is how people receive messages about climate change. So what have you learned from your professional experiences about the way humans receive messages about climate change? Well, certainly, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing, and, and very interestingly, I'm having a, a debate with a, a colleague today about how uh, we communicate some important messages that are, are emerging from, from our current assessment work. And my experience, and, and bear in mind the majority of my career has been spent in, in local government, I find the most impactful way of ensuring that people receive a message is to bundle it up in a way that talks to their priorities and needs, because that immediately opens the door. If you can speak to something that's a priority for a person or that is a very real need in their life and your message relates to that, gives them the ability to understand um, how to meet their priorities or meet their needs, provide solutions um, in, in that particular space. That's always the most effective. And, and I think that's that's the important thing is we've got to make our communication relatable. But that does put enormous pressure on because people live in different contexts, different geographies, different societies. And so priorities and needs are very different around the world. So there isn't a one size uh, fits all in terms of priorities and needs. And that really requires you to get to know uh, quite intimately, you know, what, what your stakeholder base is, is thinking about. And that requires opening up that conversation, which again takes us back to that more egalitarian form of governance where we um, have better opportunities to talk to one another about what's top of mind and what the kind of responses might be to, to meet those challenges. So then just thinking a little bit more differently about gender equity issues, what are your three suggestions for a more informed pursuit of gender equality and climate policy? And do you see climate tech playing any role in that? You know, I, I think gender is a very broad umbrella term which talks to the way we as people see ourselves uh, in society. But probably what I want to to call out, because the majority of my work um, is is in Africa, is is the role of women particularly. And I, I think there's a very important um, aspect of, of the gender conversation relating to the role of, of women in society. So if, if we go back to the fact that science is telling us to meet these enormous challenges, be that climate change, biodiversity, the pollution challenge, we need a whole of society response, we have to acknowledge that, that women around the world really pay a very pivotal role in society, you know, anchoring the family, um, certainly in the global south around issues of, of resource management. Um, and so if we are serious about this whole of society response, we really need to find ways of bringing women to, to the table. And there, I think, and here, particularly in the global south, using technology, uh, could be a very useful tool to empower them with knowledge. How can people act if they are not able to access knowledge which informs their thinking um, around the challenges and, and opportunities that we as a global society or indeed as, as local societies face? I think it also potentially gives uh, groups that may be excluded from processes like, like women access to, to processes. You know, the very fact that you and I can sit here conversing across hemispheres indicates we have a level of access facilitated by technology that would have been very hard um, to, to affect before, just given, you know, financial limitations around travel and so on. So it, it provides access, I, I believe, to women to, to processes that they may have been excluded from before. But I also think it can be a vehicle for making resources available to them um, to affect change in their communities. You know, if you think about micro-lending, 
um, and the work that's been done in places like Kenya around uh, banking using phones, that suddenly means that, you know, there's an opportunity to pool resources, to get microloans. It begins to open up a whole new world, I think, potentially. And, and that for me is, is the, the importance of technology as a tool to enable change uh, in society. And I think part of that change can be bringing some of those, those vulnerable groups like women uh, to, to the table. Linking on from what you were saying about how women possibly in, in the global south, the use of technology for leveling up and creating opportunity for engagement and responding to the challenges of climate leads on to the next question. Citizenship like gender has a powerful influence on people's experience of and responses to climate change. How has being South African and Zimbabwean affected your experience and understanding of the issue? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of, of national identities. Um, and if I think about myself within myself, I, I really regard myself as, as African first and, and foremost. Um, and, and I think it's that sense of, of being African, which has really informed my career choices because you, you can't live on this continent, you know, where the impacts of climate are just so very obvious. You know, I can recall growing up in Zimbabwe and I can remember the dry season and just how dramatic um, you know, the change was when the rainy season came, everything came back to life. So you can see this enormous impact that climate has on, on your surroundings. So it, it really sensitizes you to the power of, of climate because climate is such a key informant um, in, in Africa's day-to-day -day lives. But it also has a very strong relationship with people's well-being. You know, anyone who's lived through a drought in, in Africa knows that if the rain doesn't come, you know, people can't be fed, you can't get access to life-giving water. Think about Cape Town, which was close to becoming the first, you know, city in modern history to have a day zero to, to run out of water. So I think living in Africa really sensitizes you to the power of, of climate change, be that human-induced or through natural variability, and the way it impacts on developmental opportunities and, and well-being in, in society. But I think Africa is also a real reality check um, and, you know, it, it keeps you absolutely grounded because you can't live in Africa and not be reminded of this huge poverty and equity uh, that remains in the world and that addressing that poverty and inequity is an absolutely critical part of dealing with the climate change challenge. You simply can't adapt to climate change if you've got nothing to, to adapt with. And for me, that's the real important element in being African is it keeps you real um, about the challenges. It doesn't allow you to delude yourself um, and, and keeps you focused on that dark, you know, hard day-to-day -day work that I, I keep emphasizing. I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on the value of being a stubborn climate optimist. Is there any danger that level and scale of positivity turning toxic or even stunting our personal development on this issue? I think as as people, you know, I think our, our natural state is we want to remain hopeful about, you know, both the, the present and and the future. And and I don't think we should take that away from people because it is a, a strong motivating force. But as someone who has worked in Africa, particularly at at the local government level, which is really right up against that that coal face, um, I think it's incredibly irresponsible to pretend that a suboptimal future isn't a possibility for us, that the bold ambition around climate change, around uh, reversing biodiversity loss and, and halting that, um, you know, there's every possibility given the, the social, economic and political setup of, of the world as we see it, that that bold ambition may not, not materialize. And that means a very suboptimal future for a large portion of, of the world's population. So, I, I certainly think there is is a danger of of excessive positivity of of positivity turning toxic because it blinds us to to the reality, and so I find a stronger calling, you know, not necessarily in being hopeful and optimistic every day, but really finding the motivation in in dealing with the very real challenges um, I see around me. So for me, that that pragmatism, I think, is a is a necessary partner to to the hopefulness. Deborah, you've described yourself as a boundary person. That's something Zara spoke to you about on your research call. She made notes and compiled something we're internally calling the Dr. Deborah Roberts Boundary Person Checklist. 
She made a note of 12 traits altogether, which I'd like to read out to you if I may. Tell us if you'd like to add anything. A boundary person is someone who is not scared to fail, prepared to learn, able to be challenged, well suited to negotiate, skilled at using informal networks, skilled at leveraging relationships, works in the shadow space, who can communicate in the lingua franca of the stakeholders, is self taught does the bridging between different worlds, different disciplines and sectors, doesn't mind varying levels of discomfort, and realizes they may not be fully trusted by the communities they connect. What is the overall value that boundary people bring to climate tech and climate science? Well, I mean, just looking at at that list, I, I wouldn't want to add anything to it because it's quite a long list. <laughs> but perhaps to to summarize it, because that might be easier for people to hold in their heads. I, I think a boundary person has to be an intellectual chameleon. You know, you've got to be able to move between different fields um, with great efficiency and and be convincing in doing that. So perhaps I'd roll up those twelve into uh, you need to be an intellectual chameleon. But what is the value of, of those intellectual chameleons? Um, you know, I think their real role is in being a critical part of that communication value chain that we spoke about. So being facilitators, ensuring, you know, there's a flow of information uh, between policy and, and practice and, and science in a way that we are able to use the knowledge that comes from those different areas of human endeavor, policy, practice, and science to really understand the needs and um, challenges that our society is facing and and by understanding those in in a comprehensive way, identify responses that that are appropriate. Um, Because I think it's only by using those various knowledge sources, pinpointing where the challenges are, what kind of responses may, may be appropriate in different contexts, that we can pinpoint the climate tech that may be useful in that context. Because I think Climate tech is like climate communication. There is no one size fits all. And a lot of this work is contextual. It's about understanding people, the places they live, the natural ecosystems they they depend on. And by doing that kind of triangulation um, and digging deep, I think you're better able to pinpoint where climate tech may may be useful uh, in that scenario. I think that you gave a really great summary of um, all of those quite varied aspects of the of who a boundary person is but there were one or two that I wanted to just explore a little further with you if I may you mentioned shadow spaces and I wonder how that relates to your career was working in the shadow space a conscious choice for you or was it something that happened as you progressed your career and something you you had to tackle as you sort of develop your your career and certainly a, a career in in government, one of the the key lessons I learned that while the formal organogram is the official uh, reflection of where power and responsibility lie, very often that doesn't indicate where influence lies. So you may have a head of an organisation, but quite frankly, you often find that there's someone burrowed away in middle management who has way more influence on on the way an organisation works than than the person at the top. And I think you learn quite rapidly that if you want to get something done, you not only need to be convincing in terms of bringing issues uh, to life for for leadership to reflect on, but you need to form strong bonds and and working relationships with the people who hold significant but invisible power in in organizations. And so I think in that quest to be effective, to get the work done, uh, you are naturally drawn uh, into those shadow spaces where this almost invisible influence is becomes clear and and you can see that you know if you want to achieve a then person b and c need to be in play and need to be part of of that team so i think for me it was just part of the evolution of understanding how a large organization in my case local government actually worked um, and who actually got that hard day-to-day work done um, and then obviously being strategic in in the way that you use that knowledge in pursuing the goals that that you are responsible for and you also referenced the importance of, of trust and you highlighted that sometimes boundary people have to work in a context where they're not necessarily trusted by the communities they connect with. And so with regard to that, I'm wondering, how have you learned to adapt 
to that lack of trust? Is it something you kind of ignore and trust in the resilience of the scientific evidence that you work with? Or do you work with that distrust and actually actively engage with it? Well, from my side, I think just acknowledging it's there, you know, as my mom would say, they're neither fish nor fowl. And I think that's the problem with being a boundary person. So in my case, I'm a boundary person between the world of practice and policy and and the world of science. And so to my scientific colleagues, I'm not quite scientific enough. Um, And to my practice and policy colleagues, I'm way too scientific. Um, and so I'm, I'm not a comfortable fit anywhere in any of, of those those communities. And I think just acknowledging that, you know, it, it will not be any other way. That That is just the, the human condition. The important thing is not to let that deter you. What I have found is that uh, by being present, so, you know, demonstrating a really authentic interest and passion in the issues we're dealing with, demonstrating commitment to do hard work really eventually wins through. So while they may not trust you, uh, they will acknowledge you um, and and incorporate you into to processes. But again, that goes back to a point I've probably been reiterating through throughout our, our chat today is you need to be able to stay in the room to achieve that. You've got to be in it for, for the long haul. This is not something um, that is achieved in a day or a week. You know, very often I've been involved in processes where I've realized it's going to take me years to build um, that convincing presence in, in a process, uh, to be able to um, create that kind of authentic uh, vision of, of passion and, and commitment that that eventually um, allows the, the trust to, to slip in or the distrust to slip into to the background. So, you know, that that being in the room, not leaving at the end for the long haul, um, is is really the the way to deal with those challenges. So I think that my next question is really related to what we've just been talking about in terms of trust. Zara told me that she got into a conversation with you about accents that really intrigued her. So you connected over having a geographically ambiguous accent and this stemmed from the point you made about boundary people not being trusted. And she was talking about feeling culturally isolated by her accent because it doesn't uniquely belong to any of the places she was raised in. And that conversation made her realize how self-conscious she is about the way she speaks and the confusion and mistrust that this has inspired in people in her past. And one of the points she made was about how being unspecific in that way can compromise you. If you're a storyteller, for instance, you have to be relatable. And how relatable can you be if the accent that you have can't be placed? And also, you have to be willing to be personal and talk about yourself from time to time. And when you're someone who's grown up in a lot of different places, some people aren't going to be able to relate to your stories and what drives you. And so there's another layer of mistrust there. So here's my question. What is geographically ambiguous and private boundary woman to do? Do you push forward as you are and hope that your work finds its audience eventually? Or do you have to be open to simplifying yourself in order to be more relatable so that you can be more effective? So, I mean, that, that's a very complex question with any number of, of answers. Perhaps I'll, I'll use my answer to reinforce messages I've already made. I, I think the first and most important thing is to realize that in working in these difficult spaces where we are talking about involving multiple stakeholders um, over extensive periods of, of time, of course, the differences are, are going to raise questions in, in people's minds. And, and we, we are all different from one another to, to some extent, but there, there are um, perhaps greater commonalities that, that bind us. And I think drilling down to those greater commonalities is is the way to go. And and the way I've personally found um, a a way through it, um, and, you know, this is my personal experience, may not work for for everyone, while, you know, my my career uh, choices in terms of of being a scientist may may be questioned by some, my accent uh, may may raise uh, the eyebrows of, of others. I think you know, there's a greater commonality. People can see where there is uh, genuine commitment and and genuine passion to to make a difference. And I think being upfront uh, about that uh, will eventually win through. There's there's absolutely no doubt. I've I've found that um, consistently in in my experience. You know, I think you've got to champion the causes you you believe in. 
Um, and that that is very convincing if you do that in an authentic way. And it simply goes back to to a point uh, you know that I've, I've made time and time again is that means you've got to really stay in the room, regardless of the distrust or the queries. Uh, you know, I think some people uh, may find that kind of critical analysis quite disarming. Um, I personally just have learned to to work with it, to stay in the room, even if people don't want me there. Um, and eventually I get used to you um, and and begin to incorporate you in in their debates. And so for me, it's it's really about you know being in the trenches, being in for the long haul, doing the the hard work, um, and I think that eventually chips away at at some of these these reservations. Of course, it doesn't remove them all, but I think creates enough of a space that that you can do do good work. So, Deborah, we've covered quite a wide range of topics from your work at the IPCC right through to accents and how where we're from influences how much influence we can have. I wonder if you would like to share any final thoughts to leave our audience with on climate technology and anything from your perspective in your work or from being in Africa talking about these issues where it's a very live and real concern. Final closing thoughts you'd like to leave with us. I think the big message is that we all have a role to play. You know, this is not something we can delegate to to others given the scale of, of the challenge. And so I suppose what I'd put out there to, to the listeners is, is a, a person-to-person challenge. You know, what is your role? What room do you stay in? What conversations do you make sure that you are part of? What hard work do you need to do to make a change uh, in your communities or for communities that may be far away in other places around the world? I think that self-introspection is, is really important because very often we want to delegate these responsibilities to a government or an organization or someone else a leader in our society, and, and quite simply, that's not going to solve these problems. Each one of us needs to find the power to stand up, to be counted, um, and to do that that hard work against the odds. Deborah, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights and just being available to tell us a little bit more about the really important work that's happening at, at a grassroots level and, and with cities. It's been really fascinating to talk to you. I believe that accessibility is essential to equity, which is why all our content is free. This podcast in particular was a real labor of love. My team, i.e. my sound engineer, designer, and I managed to produce season one on a £2,000 production budget, which was provided to us by a company called Icos Chris Capital. How did we do this, I hear you wonder? Well, it took a lot of sweat and sacrifice, but in the end, we made it work because we really wanted it to work. We want the world to know about these women and the dedication, sacrifice, and pride they put into what they do. On behalf of Innes, Lauren, and myself, we hope you enjoyed season one. For updates on season two, you can subscribe to my website at www.theclimatechangeproject.today.com.